treasure trove. Sonny Jim proved a most valuable acquisition to the vital spark. He was a person of humour and resource, and though they were sometimes the victims of his practical jokes, the others of the crew forgave him readily because of the fun he made. It is true that when they were getting the greatest entertainment from him, they were, without thinking it, generally doing his work for him, for indeed he was no sailor, only a clue the mariner. But at least he was better value for his wages than the tar, who would neither take his fair share of the work nor tell a bore. Sonny Jim's finest gift was imagination. The most wonderful things in the world had happened to him when he was on the Clutha, all intensely interesting, if incredible. And Parahandy, looking at him with admiration and even envy, after a narrative more extraordinary than usual, would remark, Man, it's a pity listening to such dashed lies as a sim, for there is no doubt it is a most pleasant amusement. Macphail, the engineer, the misanthrope, could not stand the new hand. He's no a sailor at all, he protested. He's a clown. I've seen better men jumping through girls at a penny show. Well, he's maybe no awful steady at the wheel, but he has a kind, kind heart, Doogie said. He's just sublime, said Parahandy. If he was managed right, there would be money in him. Parahandy's conviction that there was money to be made out of Sunny Jim was confirmed by an episode at Tobermory, of which the memory will be redolent in Mull for years to come. The vital spark, having discharged a cargo of coal at Oban, went up the sound to load with timber and on Calve Island, which forms a natural breakwater for Tobermory Harbour, Doogie spied a stranded whale. He was not very much of a whale as whales go in Greenland, being merely a tiny fellow of about five and twenty tons, but as dead whales here are as rarely to be seen as dead donkeys, the vital spark was steered close in to afford a better view, and even stopped for a while, that Parahandy and his mate might land with the punt on the islet and examine the unfortunate cetacean. My chove is a whopper, was Doogie's comment, as he reached up and clapped the huge mountain of sea flesh on its ponderous side. It was right enough, I can see, Peter, about yon fellow Jonah. Just look at the accommodation. Just waste, pure waste, said the skipper. You can make a meal off a heron. But whales is only lumber, going about as big as a land of hussies, blowing all the time, and putting a fear of death on all the other fishies. I never had much respect for them. If they'd a whale like that aground on Clyde, said Doogie, as they returned to the vessel, they would stick bells on it. It's just thrown away on the Tober Mori folk. Sonny Jim was enchanted when he heard the whale's dimensions. Chaps, he said with enthusiasm, there's a fortune in right o. I've seen them charging tuppence to get into a tent at Vinegar Hill, where they're nothing fancier nor a sea lion or a seal. But they wouldn't be dead, said Parahandy, and there's no much fun about a whale's remains. Even if there was, we couldn't have tow him up to Gleska, and if we could, he wouldn't have keep. Jim will be going to embalm him, rig up a mast on him, and sail him up the river, you know, Jim, said Macphail with irony. I've a far better idea than that, said Sonny Jim. What's to hinder us clapping them tarpaulins round the whale where it's lying and showing it at a sixpence a heat to the Tobermory folk? Man, you'll see them rowing across in hunters, for I'll bet you there's no much fun in Tobermory in the summertime unless it's a band of hope swaree. Get a fancy name, uh, the Tobermory Treasure. Send the bellman round the tune saying it's on view tomorrow from ten till five and then going on to Oban. Dougie'll lift the money and the skipper and me'll tell the audience all about the customs of the whale when he's in life. But whale can stand by the ship at Tobermory Quay. Just what I said, all I, remarked Macphail darkly, jumping through girls. You'll need a big drum and a nap the lamp. Let us first pause and consider, remarked Parahandy with his usual caution. Is the whale oars? What else would it be, retorted Sonny Jim. It was us that fun it. And nobody's seen it for us, for it's no money yours ashore. Everything cast up on the shore belongs to the crown, 
It's the king's whale, said MacPhail. We'll let him comfort, said Sonny Jim. By the time he's here, we'll be done with it. The presumption that Tobermory could be interested in a dead whale proved quite right. It was the Glasgow Fair Week, and the local boat hirers did good business taking parties over to the island where an improvised enclosure of oars, spars, and tarpaulin and dry sails concealed the Tobermory treasure from all but those who were prepared to pay for admission. Para Handy, with his hands in his pockets and a studied air of indifference, as if the enterprise was none of his, chimed in at intervals with facts in the natural history of the whale, which Sonny Jim might overlook in the course of his introductory lecture. The biggest whale by three feet that's ever been seen in Scotland, Sonny Jim announced. Lots of folk thinks a whale's a fish, but it's nothing of the kind. It's a hot-blooded mammoth, and couldn't live in the water more than a wee while at a time without coming up to draw its breath. But this is no yin of they common whales that chases herring and goes pecking up and doon till Brannan sound. It's the kind that's catched with the harpoons and lives on nothing but rory borealises and icebergs. They used to make umbrella rubs with this particular kind chimed in the skipper, for by they're full of blubber. It's an awful useful thing a whale, gentlemen. He had apparently changed his mind about the animal, for which the previous day he had said he had no respect. Be sure and tell all your friends when you get ashore that it's maybe gone on to Oban tomorrow, requested Sonny Jim. We'll hay it up on the esplanade there and charge a shilling a heed. If we get it the length of Gleska, the price will be up to half a croon. Is it uh, a right whale? asked one of the audience in the interests of exact science. Right enough, as sure as the only thing isn't it, Captain, said Sonny Jim. What else would it be, said Parahandy indignantly? Does the gentleman think there is anything wrong with it? Perhaps he would like to take a look through it, eh, Jim? Or maybe he would want a doctor's certificate that it's no a dromedary. The exhibition of the Tobermory treasure proved so popular that its discoverers determined to run their entertainment for about a week. On the third day, passengers coming into Tobermory with the steamer Claymore sniffed with appreciation and talked about the beneficial influence of ozone. The English tourists debated whether it was due to peat or heather. In the afternoon, several yachts in the bay hurriedly got up their anchors and went up Loch Sunnet where the air seemed fresher. On the fourth day, the residents of Tobermory overwhelmed the local chemist with demands for camphor, carbolic powder, permanganate of potash, and other deodorants and disinfectants, and several plumbers were telegraphed for to Oban. The public patronage of the exhibition on Calve Island fell off. If there's only mere of them wanting to see this whale, said Sonny Jim, I'll hate to look slippy. It's no that bad to windward, said Parahandy. Uh, what, what would you say to covering it up with more tarpaulins? You make this wheel covered up with crepe or muslin, was Doogie's verdict. What you would need is armour plate, the same as they have run the cannons in the man of wars. If this wind doesn't change to the west, half the folk in Tobermory will be going to live in the cellar of the Mishnish Hotel. Suspicion fell on the Tobermory treasure on the following day, and an influential deputation waited on the priest sergeant, while the crew of the Vital Spark, with much discretion, abandoned their whale and kept to their vessel's forecastle. The sergeant informed the deputation that he had a valuable clue to the source of these extraordinary odours, but that, unfortunately, he could take no steps without a warrant from the sheriff, and the sheriff was in open. The deputation pointed out that the circumstances were too serious to permit of any protracted legal forms and ceremonies. The whale must be removed from Calve Island by its owners immediately, Otherwise, there would be a plague. With regret, the police sergeant repeated that he could do nothing without authority, but he added casually that if the deputation visited the owners of the whale and scared the life out of them, 
he would be the last man to interfere. Hello, chaps. Pull the hatch after you and keep out the cold air, said Sonny Jim, as the spokesman of the deputation came seeking for the crew in the forecastle. Uh, you'll be the better of some woody along on your hankies. We thought you were going to remove your whale to Oban before this, said the deputation sadly. I'm afraid, said Par Handy, that whale has seen its best days and wouldn't be at all popular in Oban. Well, you'll have to take it out of here immediately anyway, said the deputation. It appears to be your property. Uh, not at all, not at all, Parahandi assured him. It belongs by right to his majesty, and uh, we were just taking care of it for him till he would turn up, charging a trifle for the use of the tarpaulins and the management. It is too great a responsibility now, and we've given up the job, aren't we, Jim? Right oh, said Sonny Jim, reaching for his melodeon. And it's time you Tober Molly folk were shifting that whale. It's impossible, said the deputation. A carcass weighing nearly thirty tons, and in such a condition. Oh, indeed it is pretty bad, said Parahandy. Perhaps it would be easier to shift the toon a Tober Mori. But that was luckily not necessary, as a high tide restored the Tobermory treasure to its natural element that very afternoon. <laughs>